Hi everyone, welcome to Wandering DMs. I'm Paul. And I'm Dan. On this episode of Wandering DMs, we, and I don't know how this happened, but we managed to score a very special guest, Jeff Grubb, who <laughs> has, there's a longer biography here, but I'm just going to say a, 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 um, a committed uh, writer and designer for role-playing games and novels and video games. And Jeff, we are so happy to have you here today. I'm glad to be here. I use the term older than dirt usually when uh, referring to <laughs> <laughs> We like honoring the legacy of uh, role-playing games and fantasy novels and everything like that. Now, I have been grappling most of this week trying to get a grip on Jeff's uh, bibliography. And so I think, so here comes, here comes the most coherent synopsis I could come up with. Is Jeff okay. has uh, he worked at TSR? Uh, you're the creator for the famous Marvel superheroes original Marvel superheroes role playing game or face surf that a lot of us call it by the system. Yes, you're the creator of Spelljammer. You're the yes. creator of the Al Kadim campaign sitting. You're the writer, the creator of the initial manual of the planes, which has had a whole bunch of editions later on. Right. And you're really essential to getting Forgotten Realms published as a campaign setting. Uh, I think you're the one that actually got Ed Greenwood to 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 agree to actually publish that, right? I, I was the poor schlub who said, you know, they were looking for a new world uh, after Dragonlance had been a success, and you know, basically, I said, well, Ed's done all these articles for Dragon Magazine. Let's see if there's something behind there. And as a result, I'm the one who made the phone call. So amazing, amazing, <laughs> awesome. And yeah. so you, you've been. You've been a you've been a really in, essential writer for Forgotten Realms and Dragonlance and Ravenloft, and you've worked on properties for Warcraft and Starcraft and Star Wars and <laughs> Thieves mm -hmm. Guild and Buck Rogers and a whole bunch of other Thief stuff World. that I can't mm -hmm. can't dig, right mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, you've written you've published over a dozen novels, many short stories, a whole bunch of video games, and currently you're a narrative designer at Amazon. So That's there's correct. a whole bunch of other stuff I left out, but anyway, if somebody <laughs> didn't know who Jeff Grubb was, uh, it might points. be easier to it might be easier to name stuff that he's not involved with. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the best I can do today. <laughs> Excellent, a noble effort. So, so where yeah. where do we start, Dan? Okay, there's, you know, so I have a, I normally have a couple of introductory questions, but there's there's really big ticket items I don't I want to make sure that we do not miss. And one is Jeff among your earliest jobs, and this might be a surprise to our viewers, but among your earliest jobs at TSR, you ran the Gen Con AD and D Open in 1982, and of course that's super close to our hearts because Paul and I are currently uh, uh, working and producing our uh, our other show, The Big Bad which is a, mm -hmm. a, a produced celebrity D&D &D tournament show. And we've spent a lot of time trying to dig into the history of D&D &D tournaments and, and how the scoring went and how you ran them and stuff like that. What was, what was that like running the AD&D &D Open? Well, first off, I didn't run it. The guy in charge of the AD&D okay. &D Open was Bob Blake, a okay. you know, pharmacist from Indiana, Indiana. And he was the guy who pulled it all together and made it work every year for many, many years. Um, and I was on ba this basically, I was wrote this adventure for in, in 1982 on the, um, and that's what got me into TSR. <laughs> I'd gotten into Dungeons and Dragons back in the seven, back in the late seventies, running my own campaign, and uh, I went to school at Purdue University, which was just you know down the road uh, from you know uh, Kenosha. So the uh, so every year, every year we would come out. Uh, my gang, my D and D gang, would come out. We would come out to Lake Geneva. A friend of ours had a house on the lake there. His parents had a house. Oh, wow. We'd stay there for a couple of days, drive to Kenosha, play play and uh, play D and D for four days then come back, then go to college. You know, it was a really great nice. oper a great operation. And we got involved in running the D and D open for many for several years. So basically we started off running D and D open and after one particular I think it was I think it was like eighty one, uh, we're walking down the hall with one of one of my friends and he who was also a demon said uh, and he was loudly proclaimed uh, well that wasn't very good. I think we could write a better D and D open than that. And, <laughs> and, and Bob Blake was right ahead of us, and he turned around and said, "said Congratulations, you just <laughs> volunteered to write for next year's." And, so, and we, it was um, 
myself, Frank Dickus, uh, Jeff Lieben, and uh, Leonard Lakofka. He was the veteran of the group, and we put together a very uh, a, a stream of basically, you know, uh, could be broken into seven parts because we had uh, five day uh, five adventures that were. Um, I think maybe it was four. Four adventures that were like the, the 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 first round, then two adventures on Saturday, which were the second round, and then and then uh, the final was on Sunday. And so we basically strung together a story. It was a quest for material components for the king, that sort of thing. And everybody basically took a different shot at it, and uh, we pulled it together. Um, I was a civil engineer at that time. I had just been laid off, so I had time. So I coordinated the. Uh, the dungeon and got them uh, delivered it in February. Play tested, all set up, and on wow. the strength of that, I was hired by TSR <laughs> as a designer. Awesome. So basically, this awesome. was my audition. I, I came in and I was, you know, I was, I would, I called them every week and basically say, so how are things are going? I got to know the front desk real well, you know, and basically, you know, but do you have any jobs available? And at one point, uh, I was actually, you know out there for a wedding just down the road in Indiana. I said, I'm going to be in the area. Can I drop in? And I dropped in and did an interview with Alan Hammock and then was hired. It was, in, it was insane. It was a really wow. wonderful, wow. but it was on the strength of being able to deliver that project. That in sounds... you know months early, all, all, all wrapped up, everything was... Uh, uh, so basically, I got, did a lot of coordination for it, but Bob Blake was the guy who really put it all Great. together. So that, sounds, that sounds like yeah. a super exciting experience. Um, it was. It, 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 I, I wouldn't do it again. You know, just because it just sounds so wild and insane. So, so let me let me but, ask you a question. I've always sort of hankered to ask somebody who was who was there at the time. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe you know the answer. Maybe you don't. But I'm very curious if you have a sense for how much the uh, the whole sort of tournament scene impacted the design of the game itself. Like was I tournaments think taken well, into consideration? Yeah. Yes, I mean, uh, GDQ uh, was, yep. you know, a tournament uh, dungeon. Mm -hmm. um, yep. uh, the A series was a tournament dungeon. Uh, they were expanded out. They were so basically, you know, and a lot of it is you'd have a main line or they just wouldn't worry about, you know, uh, how to uh, finish. By the time I joined, we had sort of a format down where you, uh, we wanted to have it fit into a four hour block. Uh, the first cut for judging was how far did they get? We wanted to standardize the experience so that you know you could um, so that you know the, the team that plays on Thursday afternoon uh, basically can be judged against the team that plays a different adventure on uh, Friday morning. Because right. we can't have the same adventure because people talk and they'll say, oh, yes, there's right. a mind flayer in this right. room, uh, <laughs> etc. So we right. ended up with a – and this is you know, was in the process. We didn't do this for ours because we had a wide variety of stuff. Um, but uh, uh, eventually they standardized to the fact of having uh, a big monster, uh, a, mixed, a group of mixed monsters, an old monster used in a new way. Uh, mm -hmm. An example of that is the gelatinous cube covered with dust, so it looks like a stone block. You know, <laughs> the non-combat yeah, encounter, great, the, great, the encounter great. you can talk your way around, great, uh, great. The, the the small battle, the trick or trap, and there'd be these uh, toggles that we basically would have to hit each one of them, and then put that all together into one story. So a lot of the later, um, when we when I wrote. Um, Quest for the King, uh, which was the '82 um, the dungeon. We were all over the all over the point, and you know, uh, Lenny Lukovka had a uh, had a, like a graveyard that we were wandering through, that sort of thing. And you know, some linear, some non-linear. And as time went by, they standardized what they want to have in the game, so they could easily judge it. Uh, one dungeon I was running, and it, it was it was interesting. Uh, one dungeon I ran like the year before, or year before that, was. Um, in the final, the DM started throwing monsters at you, monster after monster after monster, and you only could solve the riddle by telling you, you the player, telling the DM to stop. <laughs> that was how, that 
that was how that was how the game how the game was broken. Basically, basically and, and I I ended up running what was the winning group, and they basically got so frustrated. Like, say, okay, now uh, five more orcs are coming in. Okay, now we've got we've got some ogres that show up. Okay, now the walls are starting to move in on you. And, and they go, okay, okay, stop it, stop it. And, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because that kind of like player puzzly, you know, mm -hmm. like a lot of people would point to that nowadays and criticize that as like, well, that's made a game. Oh, yeah. you're, you're thinking outside the character. But that was a lot right. more common at the time of like, you know, we're a game and your players and you're you're playing a puzzle. Um, and it that, was, a, that, it was that a lot more thrilled common. me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. And, and, yeah. The other thing that's and the other thing that of course you're dealing with there that's that's the interesting challenge and the overall design scope sounds you know sounds a lot to me like the like the A series modules was that right was that were those before, after before. or was those before they're a little bit before the A series the A series was before yeah the A gotcha. series I think was before before the one I did so because that was Harold Johnson so who right. was my boss right. when I joined TSR right. Right. So. Right. And it's interesting you had the the additional wrinkle of having to come up with analogous versions of the adventure in separate slots over the course of the weekend. Because right. of course, with me and Paul, yeah. with the big bad, we don't have to worry about that. We just have one That's single right. scenario that we wrote. Although, How admittedly, many... we've we've discussed that, right? Like, if we ever wanted to do well, a live true. version of it, you know, one mm -hmm. of the problems is, well, but right. then the audience from the earlier showing will yeah. tell the competitors mm -hmm. in the later showing, and then right. now it's right. not comparable anymore, right? You're right. <laughs> exactly. Good, you're yeah. right. We have yeah. discussed that. Yeah. Yeah. How many people exactly. were you were you serving in, in the open at that time? Um, eight to ten. Eight yeah, to ten. At one table, but but how many people all table. told through the oh, whole, uh, the whole yeah, yeah, we were all we were all over Kenosha. I would say there were some oh twenty four DMs, maybe thirty. Gotcha. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yes, just and we would have a uh, briefing before. Gotcha. Um, before the sessions, and they would go through. We would go through all of it and say, "Oh, does anybody have any problems?" And people would have problems with, you know, how do I handle this encounter? How do I do this? Uh, we had one occasion where a young man was, went, 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 wanted to go into excruciating detail on each encounter to basically make sure he did it right, and then he TPK'd the party in the first room. <laughs> <laughs> Okay then. <laughs> That's on brand. That's on brand. Yeah. yeah, I get that. I get that. So it sounds like so if you had like you. if you had like thirty DMs and like five ish slots over the weekend and mm -hmm. ten ish people per table. That's like that's like on the order of three thousand players over the course of the weekend. Am I am I in the ballpark that's, on that? That that sounds about right. Ten to yeah yeah yeah. Uh, wait a minute. Thirty five. 10 players per 30 DMs. Yeah. Or 1,500 or 3,000. Yeah. 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 I think it's but it was, it, was, it was a good number. And this is the AD and the Open was the predecessor to the Poly, uh, to the, um, uh, the Gen Con Open was, was the predecessor to the, to, um, the RPGA. Right. And basically, right. Right. for a while, right. they were both running, and they had different different right. styles. The RPG basically got a little bit more into both both doing a little more um, player character interaction, a little more role playing, as opposed right. to getting through and fight, fighting the monsters. Uh, and right. the open was basically much more that traditional old school sort of thing. Um, right. But again, when I, when I talk about the right. idea right. of um, uh, the idea we have to have one of each, that's much more a polyhedron idea than what we did back for the open as right. well. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So it's interesting. I mean, I had the same question that Paul does. Is like, like there are mm -hmm. there are many people that suggest that the overall structure of advanced D and D had had as a design goal to support those those tournament type games. That that was the most important thing at the time of AD and D. Do you think that the the AD and D rules were were changed like in order to support that kind of play, or is that an overblown <sighs> statement? I, I think they grew up together because when one of the things when I started playing the AD and D Open, when I started running the AD and D Opens, right. what you got was the DMG. That yeah. was the, but basically yeah. one of the first second times that I that, that I uh, ran a player's oh. handbook DMG. Oh, wow. Basically, that was the reward for the GMs, <laughs> you know, because wow. we would we would release the hardbacks at 
at Gen Con, okay? Yeah. I mean, we do yeah. one a year. Yeah. I mean, yeah. this, this is this is old guy yeah. stuff, but you know, we had, we played D&D. We had the little brown box, you know, and I saw the red box and the Holmes Basic and everything. And then the Monster Manual came out, and we tried to figure out how to make that work with you know what, what we what we had. And then the Player's Handbook came out a year later, so we had our year of playing the game without a Player's Handbook. And then the Player's Handbook showed up, and then everything shifted over. And then a year later, the DMG showed up. And the DMG was where all the experience points were for all the monsters from the monster manual too. <laughs> Two and years the combat before, too. in those yeah, in those exactly. volumes, right? You didn't get you didn't any com- you didn't get any combat statistics until you got the DMG, actually. Yeah, right. Yeah. You got that whole that appendix in there that yeah. basically you know go, goes yeah. through a lot of description about you know what they do, right. and so you know it was, it was a catch-up feature. So, I mean, kids today. We, uh, you know, you, you get all, all the books release at once, you know, the, the, yeah. they, go, they go one month, two months, three months, and you go, no, right. back in our right. day. <laughs> Starting with the player's handbook, I mean, what's up with that? I mean, you, make a, you get yeah. to make a character to begin with? <laughs> we start. We start with yeah, exactly. I I don't know. It's, it, it's just so easy these days. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> it is. Mm-hmm. Before we get off the tournament thing, I mean, so we were talking mm-hmm. before. I mean, so this came up before we actually started the show because it was among our our more interested things. Maybe tell us a little bit about how the scoring went for that because we know that there was like some tournaments like before that time scored the players individually at the table, right? And yes, we was. certainly prefer the the team-based scoring so how how was that working in 82 it was primarily team-based and that would make the assumption that if you're 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 a team qualified in one of the early rounds you'd have the same group of people for you know rounds you know uh two and three so so basically but it was a team-based advancement now within that group there was a you know choosing the best role player who was the best player and that that i believe Mm -hmm. came out of uh the rpg ga as well because they talked about individual scores at that point and had a score sheet the rpg had a score Mm -hmm. sheet for a while that basically you know was 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 with tick boxes like did this character do this did he live up to his character do you know his alignment that sort of thing so so yes, originally originally the major main score was for groups that move forward are how far did they get? And this is very yeah. basic. You know, it, it, these dungeon, yeah. dungeons had a tendency to be linear, you know, how far did they get? How many people were still alive at the yeah. end of the uh, end of the session? Uh, so these were the things that you looked at initially and it tended to work, you know, sometimes we'd have to add an extra extra GM that sort of thing just to make it uh, because we had ties and people working together i mean literally and if it was a case of uh people finishing early how fast did they do it so, mm-hmm. and these right. are things that the party, that the rpg did not pick up did not right. play with nearly as much as we did way back because we're making it up as we go along so you know we're, we're, we're discovering what's there so great great it's a it's an interesting point that you know with that i that i've made a number of times that with that that idiom of most of the adventures of the time coming out of tournaments and the tournaments having possibly thousands of people in them that you want a very small number of people to actually succeed at it so that you can pinpoint mm-hmm. them as the actual winner of the event right and then exactly when people use those same adventures in their campaigns it can be like a crushing meat grinder uh, <laughs> b- because it's because it's intentionally S1. set up that, mm-hmm. that that like one out of a thousand teams can possibly get through it and so sometimes yeah. i think when younger people are introduced to that stuff it feels like really like bone crushingly hard that's one Tomb of Horrors. I mean, they, 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 that, that's the idea of basically yeah. being is, is there yeah. are ones that are tough as possible. There are other ones that base. I thought the yeah. A series was, you know, rather rather good and balanced. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. As far as for, and also things expanded out as they were developing. I'm thinking about what you said about, uh, you know, AD and D, you know, evolving. And I, like I said, the tournament scene was first, but the uh, one of the reasons for AD and D was a standardization of the rules. We saw yeah. a lot of people, uh, particular. Uh, John Peterson goes into this in Playing at the World, right. if you've ever had the chance to read it. Basically, I, I, different areas. Er- if, if anybody, if any viewer, I'm sorry to interrupt, but if any viewer mm-hmm. hasn't gotten John Peterson's Playing at the World, it's one of my most uh, <laughs> beloved uh, books. I've had a, a small chance to speak with John Peterson in person, and he's a huge credit to the, to the hobby, and I'm so glad he's doing yes. this work. Um, he, he hates it that I keep promoting it. Uh, the, uh, but he, like he has, uh, yeah, he, he, but he's, um, 
Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's actually a book that starts the history of gaming from the dawn of time to 15 minutes before I arrived at my first Gen Con. Literally, it ends <laughs> like about the time I showed up at the first Gen Con in Kenosha. So it, it was, uh, uh, it, it's very interesting, got a lot of details. But what it points out is that a lot of different groups, particularly uh, the West Coast, basically were evolving yeah. their own forms of D&D, their own methods of play, and that's one of the things that worked for standardization and worked for basically bringing it all, uh, you know, uh, original D&D was a little more, you know, loose, go off and do, do what you want. This was to pull it all together. And I think the tournaments were a tool that were used to basically say, and this is D&D. And this is how we how we how we present it. Right. This is how we're doing. Because I'm thinking back to those uh, briefing sessions where we pulled everybody together and said, "And this is how you're going to run it. And this is you know how how you're going to uh, deal with it." Um, Faco, to hit armor class zero, came out of the tournament scene. It wasn't something that was generated from uh, TSR itself. It wasn't one of one of their ideas. It was basically a calculation that they started using as uh, a method to quickly being able to communicate uh, information. Great, great, great. Mm-hmm. I think that's a great point. I'm so glad to hear that from you, Jeb, because you know when when I read stuff that Gygax was writing, like in Dragon Magazine, the time I mm-hmm. see him make this point about standardization, and right. anybody in the world you know, really ought to be able to sit down at another table and recognize D&D. I don't see him specifically talking about tournaments, but I see him talk about standardization like this. So it's... Right. It's, 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 I, think it's, it's, I, think, I think it's much more a tool that we used as opposed to, you know, basically we created D&D to fit the tournaments. The, the tournaments were used to promote the, uh, uh, the standard, the AD&D system. That makes a lot of sense. Interesting. I'm so I'm really glad to hear. I'm really glad to hear you you share that actually because that that definitely resolves a mystery that's been in my head for a long time. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Should we talk about? Should we shift to 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 comic book type stuff? That's, sure. <laughs> So we uh, so so maybe for our viewers, uh, for some people, uh, Jeff's uh, most prominent uh, role playing um, project was the original Marvel superheroes role playing game, uh, which some people now refer to as Face Rip by the by the ability to act yeah. of course. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, I, I played that quite a bit. It, you know, it, it's actually one of the things that sucked me into Marvel comics. I actually wasn't reading much before that time. Mm-hmm. But uh, the, the you know all your your very long amount of work on that kind of sucked me into that. We have recently, like I recently introduced Paul to Marvel Face Rip on our show. We were playing in our live show yeah. on Tuesdays, and so I ran him for a couple weeks through the 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 one solo adventure that uh, that Bruce Nesmith wrote for Thor. Um, oh yes, and. Which is one of my favorite, single favorite adventures of all time, and the fact that mm-hmm. it's anyway. Let's not talk about that. Viewers can go watch that show if you want to see the the yeah. playthrough of the, the Thor solo show. So one thing I'll ask Jeff is the the game went through a number of different iterations. So there's there's a basic yes. set, there was a later advanced set, there was a there was a later revised edition. Which mm-hmm. which one is your favorite? Like if you had to run a, a Marvel superheroes game right now, which which version of the game would you pick up for that? I would go with the blue box, which is um, uh, the advanced set. Um, but I, I probably would not use the uh, Ultimate Powers book, which is very good, but just, you know, it's after my time. So Interesting. Uh, yep. you, you talk about iterations. This game started with um, in college uh, with my D&D group. We had just wrapped up a major... Um, Campaign and didn't feel like they didn't feel like playing D and D, but we still wanted to, wanted to role play. So we put together uh, Project Marvel Comics, which was set in West Lafayette, Indiana, in the Marvel Universe, and had characters like Big Man on Campus and Superpin, the Pro Bowler of Steel. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, oh no, one of my dungeon group was reading comic. I had I'd read oh, comics as great. a kid, fallen out, and I got back into it in college. It, in college, friend of mine was uh, Joe Carpiers was uh, basically uh, a, a comic book reader, and so and that's about the time that oh the Star Wars books came out, the Star Wars comics came out, and Howard the Duck, and a lot of very different you know types okay. of comics. And so that drew me back into comics, and so we started running these adventures, and eventually, of course, the campaign. Culminated, where they uh, uh, they went to New York, 
Uh, they were going to, you know, meet the mayor and fight Spider-Man. They ended up meeting Spider-Man <laughs> and fire, fighting Mayor Koch. Uh, so they, 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 uh, they, so it, it was fun. And they, you know, I had my Purdue group, I had my Pittsburgh group, and they, they, we had a lot of, um, it was very light. It was very, very light. Hmm. But when came to TSR, uh, they were asking for Blue Sky Projects, what do you want to do, what do you want to work on, and I gave them a cyberpunk adventure that was really dark, and they came back, it, it sort of like ate, ate its way through the bottom of the filing cabinet, <laughs> and they said, what else do you want? I said, well, I got this, you know, superhero game I've been working on, and we got the license for Marvel, and boom, it's, it's off the races, and there were several iterations of that universal table. Um, over yeah. time, I mean, the Universal Table is there. It is mm -hmm. is the descendant of like the old combat CRTs, combat result tables from war games, and okay. it was very, okay. but it, it was very simple. It was very colorful. It basically summarized everything into one table, and it was incredibly useful. It's one of those mechanics that I'm very, very proud of over the years. Um, and we we had a very tight deadline. Um, you'll notice the, in the credits, uh, it is co-creator myself and Steve Winter. And Steve okay. was my editor, but he also did most of the writing. I did most of the mechanics for that yellow box, for that original okay. yellow set. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, base of the whole face front true believer, that's, uh, you know, t uh, a style that we basically uh, embraced. That was, that was Steve. And, you know, he did a fantastic job for that. We teamed up again on the Advanced Marvel and then on the uh, Revised. But that's the, that's, the, that's the core of where we started. <laughs> So that, great, that's great. That, that, but we went through, yeah, you know, like I said, a number of iterations. Uh, I think for like, oh god, it felt, feels it feels like you know two years, but it was really like six weeks. I would come up with a new table, and Zeb Cook would take it apart and show that why it doesn't work, and then I would go back and I would start working on it again, and this is where we ended up. So fascinating, fascinating. Yeah. And for mm -hmm. for our viewers, uh, Jeff mentioned that the face front. Uh, the basic set is the whole thing is written in the voice of Marvel characters. So it's so it, the it, entire it, rules oops, book is about, either Spider-Man right, yes. talking to you or the Thing talking mm -hmm. to you or or, or Doctor Doom talking to you at one point about how villains work. Um, and that's very that's uh, very much a Marvel sort of thing. You know, it, it was a very yeah. direct interaction. And, yeah. and, and when I say yeah. face front true believer, yeah. that's very much the. Um, Back in the 60s, you didn't know exactly who the artist was or who the writer was, and Marvel was yeah. very good at bringing its uh, talent to the fore. You know, uh, yeah. King Kirby, you know, uh, right. Stan the Man Lee, the whole, yeah. the whole thing of that, that's sort of like very embracing, and you know, we're all in the mighty Marvel marching society. Hmm. Uh, it, it, it's very, very very, it's, it's glib to some degree, but it also has a very sort of "hey, gung ho" attitude that I think we really captured in the game. Definitely, definitely. Uh, I, I, I must apologize. The orange cat that keeps coming in is named Kekovar. Uh, he he sees when I'm on online and basically, you know, says, "Oh, I, you, you're not typing. You can t pet me now." So, <laughs> so I apologize there for Kekovar. There's an orange cat just off screen yeah. over here. So if viewers okay. see an orange cat walk into my frame, it is not. There's not a teleporting not. cat walking between okay. the frames of the show. Just to just to he's avoid a, confusion before it happens. Um, he's a flurkin. I mean, he's a big fat orange cat. It's like you know, it's like from the Captain Marvel movies. So. Exactly. It's exactly what it looks like when he when he shows up over here. Um, so speaking of the speaking of the universal table, so one of the you know th there was a time in the mid '80s after mm -hmm. the the basic Marvel game came out where TSR seemed to be changing all of its games to use a table like that. So mm -hmm. when uh, Star Frontiers, uh, sec I call it Second Edition. It, it's under the name okay. Zebulon's Guide to Space, right? So I call it Star Frontiers Second Edition changed from just a, a straight percentile system to right. a universal table with four colored gradations of success. And when TSR's Conan game came out, right, I mean, to me, it's like, why not just use D&D &D if you're going to play Conan? It had a custom universal table with four colored gradations. I think Alternity might have worked the same way. I think Alternity, if I'm not no, mistaken. but uh, I don't, I don't okay. think so. But uh, Indiana Jones. There was something else. There you go. There Indiana you go. Jones. There you go. Indiana Jones yeah, used it. And basically, the idea, one, of the, one of the ideas that you quickly you, is obvious is that they were looking at this as a way of being able to uh, quickly do licenses. Okay. Conan, 
Um, okay. Which had a, had a Jeff Butler co- 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 uh, cover. Jeff Butler was the artist mm-hmm. for uh, came on board as a com- as to draw mm-hmm. characters for um, uh, Marvel among other things. Um, he had a very distinct style. Be really nice. He did some Green Hornet stuff, which was nice. Um, Indiana Jones had its had its you know its universal table. So yes, they were looking at this, a, a copy of Gamma World used a uh, a version of Gamma World had a universal table as well. Our, our, so, our viewer but, John Miller just reminded us that that was third edition Gamma World that did that. Thank mm-hmm. you, John. Oh, trouble is, there's so yes, that's the one with the giant robots on the cover. I did the next right. one, the one for the for the uh, the right. Watsy version. So with uh, Andy Collins, oi. Right, right. <laughs> right. The were you so what so at the, in the mid '80s it just looked like universal table mechanics were just going to take over everything. Are you mm-hmm. are you surprised that that it that it that it went away? I mean, so so nowadays no. most games try to get away from any tables at all. And right. you know certainly, and use a, use a formula like maybe Thaco or maybe something better. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, instead, uh, I, now personally, like like with Marvel, I don't mind one table, like one table, and it's on the DM mm-hmm. screen, and I don't have to flip through a book. I'm just looking at the same thing. It seems to work very cover. well for me. Mm-hmm. Right, exactly. And of course, like at the very least, the the overall term universal is still with us in terms of what is this game's universal mechanic as you know people still say to this day are you surprised the table thing went away after the 80s or or, or no, you, I, I think, you, are you I think not the surprised game, by that? as i said the uh, um it's it's ancestor is the crt is the war game yeah. You know, basically, okay. where you had the little, you roll six sided dice, you get DX or D2 or, you know, AX, and basically it's a, it was a very simple combat, combat mechanic back then. And I think it's part of, you know, the evolution and the change of how games evolve. A lot of games uh, went, we've gone through a period of uh, dice games. You know, the idea of I roll X number of dice, right, and for yeah, all the right, right. I get, they're, they're good. Oh, we have a fumble dice, that's the D6 mechanic. You know, basically, if you roll badly there, you're going to, gonna, you know, it's going to negate everything. Uh, it's a lot of comparison with uh, task versus uh, difficulty. You know, mm-hmm. ability versus difficulty, how you can basically put that all together. So there, I think that there's a lot of different ways of approaching the mechanics. And I haven't really thought about the idea of, you know, the universal table going away. But you're right. I've been, I've been, uh, I go on long uh, car trips with a friend sometimes. And, you know, we, we talk about uh, games and game mechanics. And we wonder how Marvel would be redesigned. And basically, a lot of it does feel very 80s does feel very old school how would we change it and i even even though i think the uh, universal table is a component of that i probably would keep it because again it provides a central grounding point for everybody that they understand where their character falls also and one thing that works well for uh, the universal table it's that expandable out to you know uh, class thousand class three thousand beyond with the idea yeah. of different ranks and ratings because that's a comic book sort of thing particularly for you know the 60s 70s 80s how strong is the hulk who would win the fight of uh, uh the hulk versus thor there was a classic avengers defenders war where hulk and uh thor are fighting over the hammer they spend the entire battle yeah. just gripping on to that ha- hammer and they have to yeah. because otherwise they'd end the rest of the battle because they're too powerful so right right i think mm-hmm. and, and, i mean i th- i mean to a certain extent you know, having that the having the role playing game quantify those things, and I think that mm-hmm. you know maybe maybe John Peterson's actually written about this for D anD D, but having the role playing game quantify those kind of things scratch that itch of those of us who were yes you know continually tantalized by that the, exactly those questions the comic could finally pick up the role playing game finally look up the actual concrete statistic and say aha. The Hulk is clearly stronger. It says so right here, and finally, actually answer that question. <laughs> and the era, and the era that, that Marvel originally arrived in was a time when the uh, direct sale comic book shops were just getting, just yeah. taking off. They were ama- yes. you, you didn't have to go yeah. depend upon the drugstore, or you know, you could go to the Turning Page in, in Milwaukee, mm-hmm. and basically, you could get your uh, get your comic book fix every you know every Friday was comic book day. So yeah. my wife and I would drive up to Milwaukee, buy comic books, go to a Chi-Chi's, 
And uh, eat Mexican food and read comic books. Table for two, good light source is what we asked for. So <laughs> it, 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 was, it was it was it was you know, but that that was sort of the uh, um, the way it was you know way, way it all came together. So, but at the same time, the official handbooks. First of the Marvel Universe, and then for DC did their their collection as well. Then there was the uh, deluxe edition. Was very much into that defining everything about the characters. Um, we it, this is a story from uh, inside the inside the behind the scenes. We at one point said, you know, we could do the gamers guide to the Marvel Universe, the gamers handbooks, because. Marvel obviously has all the text. We can just download it, add the game stuff, boom, we're ready to go. Okay. And we, okay. we set okay. it up and then discovered that Marvel did not have it in electronic form. And the, <laughs> none of that material that was – all those amounts of text were not in ele an electronic form initially. So we had to type everything in, oh, <laughs> and oh, then no. we shared it back oh. with Marvel to basically – so they would have it uh, at, at the time. So that was that – was, we, had, we had some experiments with – Optical readers, and you know, just uh, then we had to get somebody who basically had to go through and make sure everything still scanned because it was on comic book paper. So, and but they, Marvel I feel was like great that's a, Marvel, Marvel was I wonderful like a, from the standpoint. Oh, that's, hmm? that's good to hear. I feel like that's a story that we've heard a number of times actually of people yeah. working with a licensor that are surprised at how little uh, back, whatever that's put, library uh, Bible, right. Um, mm -hmm. that they have, and that you have to wind up either relying on the third-party creators or a fan site or something like that, because you're saying that with Marvel. Uh, like, we yeah. kind of had a little bit of that issue, Paul, when we were working on a Star Trek game uh, mm -hmm. many years mm -hmm. ago, um, having trouble getting digital assets, and then I feel like we had another guest recently that said the, the exact same thing. So it's funny how it, it, well, it, it's funny how those big companies have that as kind of a little bit of a blind spot sometimes. Well, Marvel was wonderful from the standpoint of they had a warehouse across the river that, where they kept all of the stats, uh, the, the photo stats of all the pages oh. and all the oh. characters. So when I needed something, I could put in an order, and once a week or once every two weeks, somebody went over to the warehouse, pulled those over, took, yep. took new shots, and mailed them to us. Wow. And that's one reason we had all of those characters. Uh, Characters and figures, and we could use Pete. We do had original art. We had John Byrne do some yeah. of our covers, uh, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. we also had uh, a lot of pickup art. We could get very effectively, and that was a good relationship. Later, later on, uh, I was working on a DC project for WizKids, and I said, "Can you send me your Bible?" And they sent me a licensing Bible, which is, and here's the shot of Wonder Woman that you're going to use if you ever, you know, basically want to put Wonder Woman in your ad, that sort of thing. Okay. And But not that whole background stuff. Um, right, right. Star Wars has the Holocron, which is a digital online. Uh, they sent me a CD and a password uh, that basically, you know, had all the core information on it so basically you could research and find out where stuff was and it was amusing the novel I wrote was based on a, an adventure I had written for the Wizards of the Coast Star Wars game and it had a lot to do with huts so I went and started digging through all the hut material and discovered that everything they had was stuff that I had written five years before <laughs> <laughs> for the RPG <laughs> now Star Wars is great because it had lateral development. I mean, basically, a lot. I mean, Star Wars was done, you know, and, and uh, um, uh, West End picked it up, and they did a <laughs> lot. Of, they and the comic books did a lot of lateral development. They did a lot of stuff that was not in the screen. The expanded universe, which then uh, Lucasfilm took and basically say and went to its row and it went to its right. And here's what our universe is like. So uh, Bill Slavisek uh, created the Athorians, Hammerhead. From the original uh, Cantina scene, yeah. he's on screen for three seconds. You know, he's he's very distinctive. The whole idea of who he is, who what his race is, what the, what they're called, all that came from uh, Bill Slavisek and his team Great. over on uh, West End. I shouldn't just give him the sole credit. So. Great. Great. Awesome. Yeah, Fantastic. licensing licensing's fun in games. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. You wrote you wrote the. Um, uh, so speaking of making characters, right, and pulling material from the licensor, you wrote, uh, you know, the Marvel file um, yes. uh, series in Dragon Magazine for many, many years where you were presenting one or two or three or four new uh, characters out of Marvel Comics every month. Mm -hmm. How, and I always, I always wondered, like, how long did it take you 
to like write up one established character. Like I like I would feel compelled, like, well, I better go read the last two hundred issues to make sure that I have a complete comprehensive knowledge of character, whatever. Uh, how long would it normally take you to write up a new character like that? It would take me, take me, took me about a weekend um, for, for a new character. And in part, it was, they were characters that I, I like the esoteric characters. I like the, you know, the ones you don't never heard of, the Liberty Legion or you know, Howard the Duck, the, the peripheral ones. Yeah. And they fit in very nicely yeah. for the Marvel file. Um, Marvel also had us on their mailing list. So every week, a pile of comics would arrive at TSR, and I would go through all the ones that I had, hadn't been reading, so I kept up on... It's like it's professional yeah. journals. It's keeping up on Absolutely. what's going on. <laughs> and then I would put them on a, in, a, in a manila folder with a mailing list, and we would distribute them around the office. <laughs> so everybody... <laughs> so, hey, what are you doing? You're reading comics. Nope, doing research. So, okay. <laughs> Yep, yep. That's all. And That's when we awesome. had the DC license, they did the same thing. So now we had like two major comic companies, all of their input coming in and being distributed among the designers. So awesome. Great. Before we uh, move away from comics, uh, the one thing I super wanted to ask about um, when Dan introduced that we we're going to talk about comics here is the Forgotten Realms comic book. Yes. Um, so, uh, you know, I am not a big, honestly, big superhero comic guy, but the Forgotten Realms comic is one thing that I still have the complete collection sitting in my basement. Um, mm -hmm. Super loved it. Uh, how, how did that come about? Um, the Forgotten Realms comic was the second, was part of the second wave. Uh, originally, uh, we were contacted uh, DC. And uh, Mike Gold over there was interested in doing a license for TSR properties, which included at the time uh, Buck Rogers. Mm -hmm. um, so they were looking at eventually doing a Buck Rogers book, but they, they settled on originally um, uh, AD&D. Um, Gamma Rodders and Dragonlance. And Gamma Rodders was a board game that Zeb Cook designed. It was a right. Gamma World right. type with giant kaiju monsters. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so the uh, so that that was so basically they launched the three of those. Gamma Rodders did okay. Dragonlance did good. AD and D got a spinoff, and uh, Mike Fleischer wrote the first four issues of the AD and D book, and you know set the characters and everything. And then uh, he was done. He he wasn't going to do it anymore. Okay. So I auditioned and got. Um, Ish, what it turned into issues 9 to 12 of the AD&D book and you know from there we did a spin off with one of the characters from there to mm -hmm. do the forgotten realms book uh, and the uh, my artist was a new new young uh, young artist who you know this was his first big DC Rags Morales RA Morales and he's just fantastic i've got page 1 issue 1 hanging on the wall uh, upstairs <laughs> awesome. of Agravar standing on a cliff diving yeah. off, off yeah. of the uh, yeah. off the uh, edge of the uh, uh, Forgotten Realms. And this was just a great working relationship. He was, you know, it was, you know, uh, a lot of, you know, again, it was about mm, two weeks to, you know, write a script. And I was working, you know, f uh, Marvel style, which is, um, I, I we, 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 you'd uh, give him the script, he would draw stuff up, then you would fit, uh, figure where to put the uh, w uh, word balloons. You know, and how okay. the dialogue would flow based upon yep. what was yep. drawn, as opposed yep. to a full script where you just send it over, and basically that's the the editor's yeah. worry. Um, and it just, you know, we we did a, had a great time with it. It had happened over the time of troubles, so we basically handled that in the Forgotten Realms. Uh, yeah, but, I, I actually uh, really want to touch great... on that because we were we were talking yeah. earlier about like meta gaming aspects in tournaments, mm -hmm. and I feel like that comic is probably the most sort of on the nose I've seen of talking oh, about cool. the the Cataclysm. Right, I guess like Second Edition is coming out, and I remember like right. uh, I remember panels of omen talking about like how magic missile had changed and i thought yes, wow, that, that is exactly. so detailed I, that's of, meta. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that's the, that's a little bit because we yeah. were doing uh we got, were finishing up the first arc what i call the first arc of the forgotten realms which was ended with the uh, uh time of troubles with the mm -hmm. avatar crisis and that was the first big you know trilogy type thing and so we folded what we had you know we the gods walk the earth okay we've got an elven god here we can basically use him we can basically fit this in and it tells a side story uh that does not affect uh mid uh midnight and uh, Siric and the rest the rest mm -hmm. of them so it was an interesting thing it's the idea of one of the th 
core ethos of the realms is it's always something. Uh, it's everything's happening at once. Everything is going on. So it's such a big world yeah, that yeah. you know uh, Bob could be up in the Ten Towns and Doug Niles could be in the in Vasa and Damara and Ed and I are down in the Dales and you know basically we're we're basically all telling stories that are within a larger uh, universe. I, I had one rule when I was the traffic cop of the re- of the realms: don't blow up the moon. Oh, and I had two very that. gifted designers who tried that. You know? <laughs> That's Don't do any do you something need a that requires us to <laughs> requires us to mention uh, it everywhere else. Yeah, so yeah, 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 they, they yeah. blew up that the makes sense. Mm-hmm. But what about like that's the, like the, one of those that's like one of those rule like laws from like some ancient culture of like. Yes. You know, I don't know. Don't don't throw poop at a man's third wife on Thursday. Like, <laughs> was this a problem? Was this like a big problem? Eight kill not kill to... ape. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I... <laughs> so I, I'm curious on the on the meta aspect though. Like, how much instruction or direction do you, was were you getting that that you had to or did not have to address mm-hmm. meta level stuff within the game? That was mine. That yeah. was mine. I, I, I'm meta. I, I, I was. Yeah. I was. I was doing it. I got no direction for it. Um, one of the advantages of writing the comics, of course, was I knew the, where the bodies were buried. Uh, I knew what was going on in the realms. I had up to the minute information, so I did not have to, you know, basically mm-hmm. double check as much. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also, I would write a script, and I would get uh, my boss Jim Ward to approve it before yeah. I sent it to DC. And then DC would turn it around and send it back. Here's the script, and and and, and uh, Jim would say, "Yep, that's that's good. I approve of it." And basically, so they got a quick turnaround because they knew in advance what uh, yeah, what I was up to. I just I found it so um, interesting that like I feel like that's the only addition shift, and we've seen you know several addition changes now where, mm-hmm. where rules change dramatically. But I feel like that's the only one where we really saw an attempt to address the fact that the rules of the game were changing in the fiction right. of the worlds. Mm-hmm. They had the chance with third when they went to third, but they passed on it. They mm-hmm. they, they felt that you know it just would be you know to, it, at that point there was a lot of being crisised out, where mm-hmm. there seemed mm-hmm. to be every year they were basically had the the, the horde was invading and the people of the sea were mm-hmm. coming up and mm-hmm. and so it was just like I think there was a little bit of uh, big ticket fatigue at that point. So, okay. I think we had I think we had Sean Reynolds on the show about four weeks back talking mm-hmm. about that. And that his their take in third the third, the third edition era was that they they liked to just we're just re- reinterpreting the campaign right. world. Here's an opportunity to give our own spin or reinterpretation, but not have it baked into the fiction that the that the, the, the winds of magic were changing or something like that. Exactly, exactly, and I, I think that's you know, and later on they tried to spell plague for making a change over as well. Right. Right. So. Right. 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 <laughs> So they, so they have they have done that sort of like in-game shift every so often, and of course right. they jumped ahead a uh, hundred years. That was another thing. Fascinating, fascinating. Mm-hmm. So I I wish so I so I'm glad that you you brought up the issue of like what was the Marvel style at, like actually because coincident like I, at one point in my life I really How really wanted to the be Marvel like way. a comic book <laughs> yes. yeah. Right, and you know, mm-hmm. coincident. I was actually read. I was I picked this up and was looking at it like yesterday. It, like completely coincidentally, I'm like, oh wow, this might possibly feed into the interview tomorrow. That might be handy to know know more about that. And I was totally gonna, you know, with the the way that the 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 writer and the artist interface in here actually was was one of the things mm-hmm. I was going to ask because that's obviously about ten or twelve years before you were writing, and I was wondering if the style was was still the same for the Marvel method at that point. Um, and when I see comic book mm. writers nowadays write, their scripts are incredibly detailed. The writer is specifying yes. the panel layout on the page and that's, all that's stuff a like that. That's approach. Yeah. And I would, I would basically uh, do, the full, do the layout on the page as well. In the upper right-hand corner, I drew a little picture of this is going to be the okay. big box. Okay. This is going to be the, And okay. This, okay. Was, this was more suggestions than rules because okay. uh, Rags would basically say, no, no, you can, you can do it better. Tell the story better this way. And he he could lay it out and inevitably made it better. So we we had one where um, the head cheese uh, episode, the one where uh, Foxy is addicted to cheese. um, That originally came out of the fact of in comic book, the business of comic books, at the time comic books were 24 pages long. Mm -hmm. It would take an artist about, uh, could do a page a day. Okay. 24 monthly comic book, not a lot of room for yeah. error. 
not a lot of room for basically someone gets sick or someone misses a misses a deadline or that that sort of thing. So so literally, um, we wanted to come up with a story that basically took place mostly in Foxy's head, so we would have a lot of black space. <laughs> and, and Rags got the story, but he liked it so much that he started drawing all the stuff that basically we were not, not showing there. And so you know, we ended up even further behind. Uh, that, uh, that, that just, but that that particular story went very, very well. That's one of the ones I'm proud of. I mean, I, uh, Jim Ward liked it so much he, when he got the pencils, he hung it up outside his office so everybody could great. read it. That's great. So that 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 was wonderful. And we also talking of meta, we did the uh, everyone wants to. The behind the scenes at the Forgotten Realms, where everybody's got computer monitors yeah, and all yeah, yeah. everything. That's that's incredibly meta, and that was a fill-in issue mm-hmm. that Rags did after he left. Uh, so, and when we ra- were wrapping up the series, okay, we've we've got this issue. Let's put it in, mm-hmm. and you can see a lot of the TSR talent is oh, there in that. Ed's Ed's there. Um, Jim Louder and I are there, being lectured uh, by El Minster yep. on Mulhol- <laughs> Mulholland Pops. Uh, the late Kim Yale is there. Elliot Magan, who wrote Superman novels and wrote Superman for many years, he was our editor for a while, and he's shown storming down the halls, grumbling about you know all the stuff that's going on in in, in the various campaign settings. Um, we did have a sign. We had a sign that got edited out. That basically was uh, the, the they did. My bosses did not approve. It basically had a big door that says "The Nine Hells Do Not Open Ever." You know, because that's <laughs> when we were getting away from <laughs> right, and, right, right, all the right, devils. Right. And uh, they said, "No, you got to got to got to cover that one." Okay, cover that fine. One. <laughs> awesome. I always thought the basic premise of of the of the series of of a group of adventurers who are actively mm-hmm. seeking out uh, you know artifacts to destroy or contain. I thought that was like this just sounds like a great setup for an actual campaign. I'm I'm kind of curious yeah. is, were you is it at all based on a on an actual game that was being played anywhere? No. Um not really. Uh the Percheron which is uh, a ship in Dragonlance came out of a campaign that I was running in. That was my ship. And so uh, we had a copy of the old Chivalry and Sorceries by Reams and Galleys, which was basically big okay. plans of all these, you know, sailing ships. So we used that in the campaign, and then we stole it and took it over to um, uh, Dragonlance when it became, when we needed, needed a, it's because we, you, we looted heavily from our previous campaigns where <laughs> yeah, we, we created stuff. Um, but the, the uh, Realms Master basically was, you know, basically of that flying ship type category. We wanted to be able to move them around. We wanted yep. to be able to uh, go from place to place very quickly. Um, uh, Agravar I had previous from, pre- previous from the AD&D books. The other characters were mostly created from whole cloth. You know, they they don't don't have a a predecessor in there, so but they they were good characters. I, I really you know, I really yeah. did a couple short stories with them, but that's you know that's long gone now. So probably minder still right. around. I, I apologize. I got to bring this back before we run out of time. I got to <laughs> yes. bring this back. We, we got a long play game, and for viewers, yep. uh, there's a little bit of a tug of war happening between Dan and Paul right at the moment about <laughs> our our favorite. <laughs> Jeff Grubb property, so I'm sorry if this ping pongs oh back and forth. That's what happens on Wandering DMs. Mm-hmm. So for, for the last two weeks, I've actually written blog articles about one specific rule in the Marvel Superheroes role-playing game, and that is a rule that did not exist in the, the first edition, but did show up in the, the Blue Box Advanced Edition, and that is the Power mm-hmm. Stunt rule, um, yes. whereby you can, you can pay uh, karma get a role to possibly use a power in a new novel way and it gets easier the more times you try it. Now, right. the thing that occurred to me is that there's there's a bifurcation there between if you have a custom, you know, unique character that the player made up versus mm-hmm. established characters from Marvel Comics and part of the rule says is the more times that you can spot that stunt being used in the Marvel Comics backlog the more mm-hmm. likely it is for the character it to actually happen. use it. So, yes. are you are you are you to this day are you happy with that rule, Jeff? And did you have players actually go through the back catalog counting occurrences <laughs> in order to help them at the table? 
I was I was very in my campaigns. I was very easy with it. The idea of you know okay. if you could say well Quicksilver you know Quicksilver in this issue of Avengers ran around in a circle and created a whirlwind mm-hmm. to be able to cushion something. Mm-hmm. Okay, fine, you know. But okay. you would have okay. a lot of stuff that would show up in the comics that basically is the, sometimes it's a one shot. It's just showing off. Spider Man makes a glider out of uh, web fluid, you know, and that's a, that's a great image. And it goes, I think he did it once, you know, that that sort of thing. Because yeah. otherwise, you're always he's always running out of it, and you know, here's he making a glider, a, a hang glider. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, so the idea of I was very very accommodating when I was running as far as that, if okay. we could say yes. But most of the characters, and that was mostly uh, most of the characters <laughs> I ran were person were, were creations of the players. So they, they were okay. creating their own heroes as opposed to uh, as opposed to you know basically I'm going to run run Captain America. When we did the original book, Marvel Marvel did not want to see um, character generation because you're licensing Marvel, really? you're playing okay. Captain America yeah. and Spider Man, okay. and we put something okay. in the back. And when we came down to the advanced game. They they basically okay. turn to us and say, and one thing you must do is have character generation in there. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we're good. Uh, fat. I mean, that was yeah. my that was going to be my other question about which one you mm-hmm. did more in your own games. I think that we, I mean, the attraction is you know the Marvel. I mean, one of the main selling attractions, of course, is the known Marvel characters. That's right. primarily the, the IP one. that the company has. Right. And I think that the couple of times Paul and I have played, it's been at a convention situ- a one-off convention situation, and then it's probably yeah, easiest out. to pick up a known character. And I was wondering which one mm-hmm. you did more, so that's interesting to hear itself. In my, in yeah. my, when, I, when I was running early on, it was mostly created. I used the Marvel Universe for bad guys. I used the Marvel Universe for okay. Spider-Man yeah. to appear. I did not, you, I, basically, Great. and I used a random roll table. I, 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 am a, I am a fan of that. I, you know... Uh, the villains and vigilantes had a you know wonderful you know whole table type setup. We built our own, which was you know very very useful. Um, yeah. It was very fortunate in the fact that we slotted in more complex than I'd say V and V, but less much less so than tra- uh, champions. Uh, yeah. I would okay. early on I would get three different types of reviews for Marvel. Uh, I love your game. I love your game, and here's how you fix it. And I play champions, and I buy everything you do and loot it. <laughs> so they basically <laughs> okay. people were transferring okay. from over yeah. phase rip into the champion system. Okay, great. Great, great. So it sounds like when someone wanted to use a power stunt, you didn't, as the judge, you didn't literally say, tell me how many times you've seen in a comic book. It sounds no. like you didn't actually no, I didn't. do that. Okay. <laughs> All right. I, I a reasonable... Say, can, can you give me an example? You know, that, that, that was much more of the case, so... Okay. 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 A reasonable, judicious, and wise way of playing it. I think that's good. Exactly. That's good for that's and, good for that's good for this judge to hear. <laughs> and it's a it's it's a friendly game as opposed to a tournament game. So you know, tournament basically you're getting a whole lot of different pieces uh, all coming together there, because your players have different knowledge bases. You're going to have the guy who's the encyclopedia who's read everything, and the guy who argues with the encyclopedia basically because it makes no sense. You know and. Right. And the right. guy who says, "Yeah, so Captain America's got a shield, okay, so. <laughs> and he works yeah. for Shield. Yeah. Is there is there yeah. a connection between yeah. the two? You know, <laughs> well, actually, he no longer works for Shield because nice. he and Nick Fury had a fight in, uh, St- nice. in Tales of Suspense number sixteen. So. Is he friends with Superman? Right? He's, he, I think he's on a team yeah. with Superman. I think, right? I think yeah. I think I remember <laughs> Spider-Man and Superman teaming up once. That's a thing, right? <laughs> Happened twice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Awesome. All right. Well, we are we are just about out of time. I know that we have only uh, barely touched the tip of the <laughs> tip of the that. iceberg here. Uh, yeah. Of course, of course. Uh, any any I guess any final thoughts here? Anything uh, that we wanted to to return to or didn't get to uh, bring up? <clears throat> There's a lot of stuff. Is there anything? I've done a lot of stuff. Okay. Awesome. Not really. I, I think we I think we've done a lot on the tournaments. We've talked a lot about Marvel. You know, yeah. we've touched on the on the comic books itself. And I'm very fortunate in the fact that I've had a long uh, history, and we got a chance to work on a lot of different products. Uh, Zeb uh, Cook always says that designers tend to have a low boredom threshold. So I'm always going off and finding the next thing that I want to uh, want to work on and be a part of. I'm yep. you know, still doing the occasional essay. I'm still showing up for conventions every so often, but you know, but pre- pretty much I'm you know concentrating on my day job. 
Yeah, I was I was gonna say like I think we 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 managed to cover your stuff maybe up until like the the early nineties. So uh, <laughs> yeah, we still got a couple yeah, decades to cover here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh jeez. We uh, so among the things we didn't get to, uh, Spelljammer and our friends over at yes. WebDM actually did a really nice mm-hmm. episode on Spelljammer a couple years back. Mm-hmm. Uh, Al Kadim. I mean, I had a bunch of other questions about Manual of the Planes we didn't get to. So. Et cetera, et cetera, and the novels and Azure Bonds and video game work and all and on and on. So, so Jeff, I guess I got to ask: Can we possibly get you get you back again some some day next year? I hope. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Awesome. I'll be around. Awesome. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Okay. Any all questions right. from the floor? Yeah, Anything from the chat? So, okay. Yeah, I guess I will. I will ask uh, any of our any of our viewers who who do have questions or folks who are watching this video after the fact, please leave some questions for us in the comments section. Uh, we'll build it up, and then next time we get uh, Jeff to reappear, we should have a uh, uh, probably way too much to cover again, right? Right. <laughs> Sorry. Right. To that to you. So so please uh, please leave your questions in the comments. We'd love to hear them. Absolutely. Okay. And if you are uh, new to the show, uh, remember that you can like and follow, and subscribe to us, the Wandering DM for content like this. Uh, we're on YouTube, we're on Twitch, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, and we do have the handle Wandering DMs, all one word, uh, on all of those channels. So please uh, please look for us there. Likewise, if you prefer to listen to the show in audio-only podcast format, you can do that. Uh, it's available on our website at wanderingdms.com, as well as various podcast carriers such as iTunes and Spotify. Uh, if you are listening to us on one of those other carriers, please take a moment to rate and review us there. We would really appreciate it. We, we very much do. Uh, as always, a big, big thanks to our growing list of patrons who support the Wandering DMs channel here. Uh, if you would like to join uh, them and support the Wandering DMs channel, please visit patreon.com slash wandering DMs, uh, and you'll, be, you'll have access to our Discord server where we have chats uh, immediately following our talk show like we'll have today, uh, and you'll have all the, the fresh news about our upcoming episodes of our tournament D&D show, The Big Bad, and we will have episode two, The Big Bad versus East Coast Slayers Gaming Group, coming up this Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern time, so please look for that and our other shows here on the Wandering DMs channel. Uh, Jeff, thank you so much for joining us today. This was invaluable, and we will need to get you back, possibly as a regular guest, because you might produce oh stuff faster than we can cover them on the show. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. It's been great. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, remember, everybody, we are live every Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern time, so we hope that you will join us again next week for another thought-provoking discussion. We'll see you then.